I would like to, to speak to you about the acute respiratory diseases and a specific biometeorological index called MCI. So I will speak basically about one of these diseases, influenza, an infectious disease. But final results in these projects we have been developing for six, seven years. The, these results, these new outcomes, are taking us to work not only with influenza but with other acute respiratory diseases in the last project we have obtained from the national funding. So it's very interesting, the last talk we had here about how to model things and it's also uh, my idea to make you think about uh, <coughs> how important the interactions are the inputs for these models are in order to obtain good results. So this is going to be the index. Just uh, I will ask you different things at the beginning in the introduction and then I will present the index. It's very easy to compute, to calculate and I will show you how this index was applied first time in Spain and then later on in the United States and I will introduce some new approaches we want to follow in the future with final conclusions about this presentation. So is the weather affecting us? Yes. Yes. Only one factor like temperature. When we look here at low temperature of high temperatures and we look for references and papers and bibliography it's clearly related low temperatures to muscular fibrillation or to skin vasoconstriction. High temperatures are going to affect heart frequency and uh, sweating increment or hyperventilation. But when we have extreme temperatures, the direct effects, I'm not speaking about indirect effects, but direct effects of extreme cold can take us to hypothermia, frostbites, fractures, or extreme hot can produce dermatitis, edemas, sunburns, sunstrokes, heat syncope, exhaustion, many things. So only one factor, but from a, an atmospheric point of view, we have so many variables that if we consider the second one, air humidity, like the amount of steam in the air, we know that low humidity is related to asthma because of pollens, right? And also we know that high humidity is related to rhinitis and asthma because of mites. And this is the amount of grains we obtain in Spain in relation to this variable is going to be very different in the inner of Spain or when we are by the sea. So this is a very important factor for many people who are suffering these problems. What about pressure? atmospheric pressure, just the air, uh, the weight of the air we have on us. So it's been linked to headaches, okay, with sudden changes. It's been linked to heart diseases, okay, after 10 years of studying more than 200,000 uh, men between 25 and 64 years, detected, it was detected a relationship, a uh, V-shaped relationship between atmospheric pressure and coronary diseases. These are the references you have. And also, it's been linked to a spontaneous pneumothorax, okay, in this study, the last one. Right. So, atmospheric pressure, it is there, and it, it is affecting some people, all of us, but in some cases it's impacting seriously health of people. What about winds? We have a wind in Cantabria, the place where I work, that is called uh, the south wind. And when we get this wind, we go crazy. But there is a wind like this in many parts of the world. You know, because this wind is affecting the parasympathetic system. Uh, the activity is stimulated. It's affecting our psychological state. So it's, real, it's very linked to emotional disorders, depression, suicides. You have Sirocco in Sahara, Ofuen in the Alps, Chinook in the Rocky Mountains, Puelche in the Andes in Latin America, Austria in Romania, 
I'm sure you have in your country one win that people knowledge say that is related to changes in your mood. There must be a reason. And also cold winds, in this case, they will affect the sympathetic system. So we will increase mixture of diuresis. Uh, the, these cold winds can alter the respiration dynamics or increase of pain sensitivity on rheumatic patients. So one, two, three, four factors, four variables. They are here now. They are constantly interacting with living organisms. And many others variables, like sun radiation, the amount of ultraviolet, ultraviolet radiation, sun burns or skin cancer, the amount of light, precipitation, rain, snow, rainfall, can increase indirectly the number of car accidents, and indirectly there is an increase in the number of people who get injured or die. Snow storms, this is something it has been studied in the east coast of the United States and it's been related to heart attacks indirectly because when there is a big snowstorm, many people will try to clean the main door of the house. They will do an extra effort, physical effort, and they do not survive because they do not have a physical activity daily. So and there is several papers that are relating this. So indirectly, we have many effects from atmospheric variables and storms directly because of rays, floodings, landslides, and positive ions or negative ions in the atmosphere. These situations are related to headaches, nasal congestion, sore throat, increase in blood pressure, lack of concentration. Uh, positive ions are, are bad for human beings, negative ions are good. When I spoke about uh, hot winds, these hot winds, they, they come when they arrive, uh, plenty of positive ions. And this is the environment that is created in the atmosphere that is quite similar to the environment we were having this morning or on Tuesday morning in the lab, right? And you have to feel different when you are in one of these environments because of these positive ions, right? So, and when all these things are combined, when we have a synoptic situation in which there is high pressure, stability, high temperatures, we have high level of pollution, for instance, and there are other social and personal aspects that are making us vulnerable. What we have is a meteorotropic bump. This is quiet. Societies will not realize about this combination, but there is an increase in morbidity and mortality in many places because of these combinations. So because weather forecast is doing very well in the last 10 years, 20 years, for two, three days in advance, we have this input in order to forecast impacts on health. So, but it is important to know how we perceive threats from the atmosphere, okay? In this picture, in this graph, you can see 1st of January and the last day of the year. This is a period of 20 years in a community in the north of Spain of 20 million, 2 million people. And this is the number of people uh, who die every day, the average, okay? So today we think this is summertime, and then we have autumn and winter on the extremes. But the perception we have now in Europe is that heat is killing people. So we are focused on this, mass media, TV, heat waves. Uh, have produced an impact on, yes? Why are there not equal two ends? Sorry? Two ends. Yeah, well, why is it not periodic? It's not, it's, this is first day, first of January. Oh, 
20 days of, of data of this day, the average. And this is the 31 of December. Which is the day before the first. So no, 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 this is not, no. That's not the way you should read this, uh, this graph. I mean, if you take uh, this day for 20, for 20 years, you get an average. That's all, OK? And then if you take how many people died the 1st of January for this period of 20 years, you get an average. Yeah, but it's very surprising. Sorry, a sum. As, no, sorry. <laughs> it's, not an, it's not an average. It's the sum. No, I mean, if today, let's say today. It's very surprising that the average number of deaths on the 1st of January is so different to the average number of deaths on the 31st, the 31st of December. The average, no, is the, the addition, yeah. right? So there was one day, this day, that there were for 20 years, more than um, about 1,200 people died. Okay, so in the last day, you don't have to. The, the value shouldn't be 1,200 people dying. It's different. You understand? Yeah, I understand that. It's absolutely different. Each day, the total amount of people yeah, who died. The curve but should have the same height at the two ends. You know, yes. this is the question. Actually, the data look very similar at the two ends. It's just the, it's the, 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 the fitting curve that is the, that is uh, uh, yeah. fitting curve. Yeah, it's the fitting curve that is the different. The two ends. So but data the data is five. There might be a mistake yeah. then. Let me. This is third sixty one. Well, the point of this is to to tell you that if we focus on the summer time. We are forgotten about the winter time when people are dying much more, many more people are dying, okay, than on, win on summer time. But we are investing a lot of money on research to study heat waves on summer time now, instead of looking at what's going on on winter, on winter time, when the death rate is much higher, okay? That's the idea I wanted to express with this, with this graph. And also, I want you to tell me what you can see in this video that is presenting the summer day probability, considering that uh, one day is a summer day when the temp maximum temperature it was over 25 degrees in this region of the world. Yes, I want you to pay attention to the video. Yes, to tell me what you see. This for one year. We have four seasons in this area of the world. And here we have the probability of having one of these days, 100 on zero. So as you can see, when the spring and summer are arriving, probabilities are changing. So, but what we see here, apart from the video, is changes constantly, periodically, seasonality, right? At this scale, this is not. <laughs> <laughs> So <coughs> right, changes at this scale. And this is on Tuesday, okay? You were here. Okay? And it was really hot. <laughs> at least I, I could feel it. Okay? And I was I was using this data logger, just because I usually take one of these. And I was registering temperature and dew point and air humidity every two seconds in this place. Okay? This is 10, 13, 33. And this is at the end of the day, 18, 13. Right? And these are the lines of temperature and relative humidity. 
there is something strange here, very strange, with relative humidity. Okay, it's probably it's from 10 to 11, quarter past 11. I don't really know what it is. And this is working fine. Do you have any idea? You were suffering this <laughs> every two seconds. Exactly, you're right. There is an air conditioning machine upstairs, and suddenly these air conditionings, they have a very small variability. Constantly they are changing the measurement. They, they, they produce s small changes, but very rapidly. And when you measure this every two seconds with a sensor, you realize that something is going on at this scale. Scales are going to be important, very important to understand the impacts of meteorological factors on health, right? So, and then we have how at six in the afternoon, we have the relative, relative humidity was increasing and temperature was going down. This is what the data logger register, okay? And if we look at the data, you can see that temperature this is uh, Tuesday, 10, 13, 33, 35, 37. In six seconds, no changes. In eight seconds, 0 0.1 up Celsius degree. Is this a lot? Is it not a lot? What do you think? Then no changes, 28. So it's 0 0.1 up, 28, 10, 28, 10, 28, 20. So, okay, and air humidity every two seconds is changing, right? And you point, okay, 66 and 57 percentage. So, in half minute, right? We are constantly adapting to this. We are thermoregulating, right? That's why we don't realize. Okay, but this is the same idea, temperature for this period from 10, 13 to 10, 5 minutes, so, sorry, 10, yes, 5, 1, 2, 3, 5, 18, right? This is the line, but this is the projections we have for climate change. This is from 2000 to 2100, 100 years, and this is the range of 5 Celsius degrees, and this is from 27 to 32, 5 Celsius degrees. What is this? How do you interpret this? Are these changes producing the same impact at a specific scale than these changes producing an impact at a different scale? What do you think? Sorry, is that possible? Am I dreaming? <laughs> what is? You don't have extreme events in the lab. Extreme events? You don't have extreme events on the left. It depends on the scale. But on the right, because it's a scale. On the right. Yeah, you have lots of extreme events there, which you don't see in the graph. Yeah, but just keep the idea, right? period of 100 years, short period of time. We are speaking of the same variable. And what about the other factor, uh, air humidity? This is in the lab too, okay? But this is the increase or decrease we have every two seconds, right? You were here and you were experienced this up and down of air humidity because it's different to go from 40% to 60% progressively than with changes in the series. Because contrast is going to affect us more because of the way we are making our immune system works than if we give this immune system time to thermoregulate progressively. That's the idea, okay? 
if there is a linear progression, constantly there is an increase, we are able to do it well, there is no problem, but if there is an up and down, we are giving contradictory information to our system in terms of thermoregulation, right? That is the idea. So the scale is going to be very important. So if we think at a microbiological scale, or if we think on climate change, at any scale, we can get health impacts. And then we start these processes of thermoregulating, acclimatizing, and adaptation, or we migrate to avoid health crisis, morbidity, and mortality. That's the theory, OK? Climate change is not more than climate variability. So how changes can affect life and can affect people's health? This is a picture of a virus, of influenza virus. And this is, according to the hypothesis Gaia, a living organism, the Earth. Both are living, so living organisms. Let's think in this way. So what changes do I have to apply to this virus or to this living organism to impact on it? It will depend on the scale. I'm telling you this because this is the idea in which the index we are working with is based on, right? So changes are producing biometeorological distress at this scale or at this scale, right? So if we create a table with uh, different types of variability and with the different levels of people's vulnerability, we have these levels from the base level, level one, two, three, four, five. And we consider that normal variability, we are used to normal variability. So when vulnerability is low, there is no impact. Or if our vulnerability is medium, or high, we get a level one or level two. When there is an anomalous variability, then these impacts, these risk levels can increase a little bit, mainly when your vulnerability is high. And when we have an extreme event, then this, this vulnerability is going to take you to uh, the highest levels of impact or risk. In this case, this three, four, five is there because your risk will depend also on the technological development of your country, the access to medicines, and so on. There will be a geographical factor to cloud, not only here, but in all places, right? In order to estimate risk. So, based on these general ideas, I want to show you one of the first cases in which we were using this index I will introduce you today. We were using influenza uh, data, and this is a very complex issue because of the microbiological dimension, the environmental dimension, and the spatial dimension of the spreading processes. So the first hypothesis, or first question, is climate a factor that affects to influenza transmission? When I was asking this to one of the experts, on influenza in the United Kingdom in a conference, the answer was, it statistically has not been proved. What do you think? What do you believe? Physically, it's a seasonal disease. <coughs> it's according to the seasonality we have, at least in temperate areas. Statistically, it's not been proved. You have to make a decision. I believe there is a link, physically. But if you believe in, on statistics, there is no link. What do you believe? You don't believe anything. No? <laughs> OK. <laughs> so a simple question is not, yes? Yeah. Uh, can I say something? Sure. Uh, 
Sure. I think what he was trying to say is that in medicine, we look at um, cost-effect relationship. Mm -hmm. For instance, if you're talking about influenza, you should be able to say this organism causes this. However, in the context in which you are looking at it, it could be a kind of relationship, a, a kind of predisposing factor. Excellent. There are so many other factors that come together to um, affect the spread or transmission of the influenza. But it might not, medically speaking, it may not be direct relationship. Excellent. That is what he was trying to say. Excellent answer. That's the answer. Yeah. So, but we have a second question. Does influenza transmission depend to some extent on meteorological contrast? This is our hypothesis. We think yes. Why? Because we think that meteorological contrast is making the immune system of people weaker, and this is being proved because of stress, and also because this is something we don't know, viruses become more aggressive in terms of virulence, or both could be combined. This is an hypothesis, right? So how can contrast be defined? If we believe this is like this, how can we define contrast as at a synoptic scale? Because we know that spatial and temporal variability of atmospheric factors is, is huge. So if we want to have a mesoscale approach, a synoptic scale, let's say one country that is 1,000 kilometers by 1,000 kilometers, what we have to use to define an index with this idea of contrast is going to be weather types, atmospheric weather types or circulation types. And this is what we did with this idea of the index. So we were using different points of sea level surface pressure and from the European Center for Medium Weather Forecast to define a catalog of types of atmospheric circulation. So a catalog is formed by a list of Adventist weather types, two rotational ones and one undefined type. And uh, there are many classifications we can use. This is produced by meteorologists or climatologists and this is going to be our input for the index. Okay, it's based on these formulations. So we get four daily weather types of atmospheric circulation for a selected period, right? Weather types of, we at, let's say one is north, one is south. The wind is coming from the north today. Tomorrow is coming from the south at 12. And we create a list for the study period like this, like 2000, one week, another week, another week, epidemiological week. They start on Sunday, they will finish on Saturday, internationally. So we have the date, and we have at 12, at noon, at 12 in the a.m., and we have the types here, okay? A is an H, high pressure, okay? Because this is in Spanish, it represents, but then we have west, 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 southwest, west, north, north, west, and so on. This is the type we have, it's defining the main component of the atmospheric circulation for a specific country in this case, right? That's the mesoscale approach. And then we will compute three parameters, very, very easy. One is called diversity, the other one is called outbreaks, and the impact or the intensity, the final number of the contrast, right? So diversity is going to be how many types we have in one epidemiologic week, okay? If we have north, 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 south, 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 we have diversity of two. In this case, there is only one break in the, in the sequence. We have the outbreak is one, the second parameter. And then the impact is going to compute, assuming that when we move from north to south, according to the rows, uh, wind rows, the number 
the biometrological distress is 180. And if we move from north to east, then it's 90. And so we assume this to define a matrix of contrast using this classification, right? That's the, the, the idea of the index. Assuming that this number is representing biometrological distress. Right? So in this case, we have this week, and this is the result. Okay? Four types. We have A, W, SW, NW. Four, four outbreaks and 225. And this is the sequence okay, of types. And this is the other week and the other week. So we can move one day and then we calculate it again and so on. So it's open to many different ways of calculation. And there is a tool to do this. And also it's possible to, to work with many different classifications. Because classifications are just stages, right? Okay, we want to define atmospheric stages. And this can be done with uh, just with a mesoscale factor like this or with one variable. We say stage one is when you have in between five Celsius degree and 10. Stage two is when you have 10 in between 10 and 15. Stage three, because we know that these limits are important for some reason, right? So these are going to be, these three stages will be the inputs to compute this. And then uh, we started to use the information from different autonomous communities in Spain. And uh, this information was given by the National Institute of Epidemiology. And as you know, uh, this period in our latitude from week 40 to week 20 next year is the period that we are observing if there are, there are influenza cases. And I want you to focus on this idea of special units of registering data sets. Each autonomous community, this is the Mediterranean Sea, you have Africa here, each autonomous community is registering information according to the administrative boundaries, right? But we decided to <coughs> define only three units that are climatic units, okay? We have an Atlantic Oceanic climate here, this is a continental area, this is a Mediterranean climate, right? So we, defined, we decided to integrate this information only in three units, and this is the sequence of the influenza rate evolution from 2000 to 2009. From, and as you can see, we had a, an important epidemic in 2001, 2000, 2002, another one from 2004, 2005, right? So, and reading some uh, articles from microbiologists and medis, medical doctors, we found that it, there is always an explanation for influenza spreading that is crowding because people get together and then the, the influenza is spread more easily. But we realized that looking at these lines, they are parallels, but according to this idea related to cold, to low temperatures, the highest values for these uh, 10 years should be in this area, in the continental one, where temperatures are very low, but not in the north where we found all these years that rate was higher. So this explanation of crowding, in this case, it didn't work. And we were considering that maybe, at least in this area, people get together even more when it's raining than when it's very cold. Because if it, even if it is very cold, you keep walking. You don't stop. You will stop in a place when it is raining. But this crowding linked to cold or low temperatures is constantly published in many papers. But we thought that maybe when it's raining is when we will stop. And when it's raining, the air humidity is really high. So it's perfect to transmit the virus, right? So, and also when it is raining, it is because it's very cloudy. And this region is very cloudy. And when it's very cloudy, there is no sun radiation. But there is sun radiation here, because clouds will stop there. Rain will stop 
here in many cases. So, but we found that sun radiation is linked to vitamin D. And some expert told us that vitamin D is related to a protein. I'm not an expert on this. And this protein is very related to the probability of being infected. So maybe rainfall, sun radiation, is also very important in terms of spreading the disease. More than cold, or as important as cold or low temperatures. So that's why we have to be careful with sun assumptions that are constantly published in international journal. Maybe this could be an explanation in this particular case, right? So when we compute the index, this third parameter, we found this is the national rate, the rate in the community of Madrid, in the rate in the north of Spain. We found this is how the value is changing through the period. And we found that when there is a high, this is 2000 and this case, that it seems that when there is a, an important value of this contrast, it's like a second uh, factor that is promoting the spreading of the disease apart from the disease itself, right? And in this case, in this period with uh, the second most important epidemic, there is also this behavior that is telling us that maybe this is an interesting point to include in epidemiological models. We are not trying to look at direct relationship, but maybe it's a factor that epidemiological models should include in the future, right? Because when we look at the data of these graphs, this is the first factor, diversity, outbreaks, and in this case, intensity of contrast. And then we see that the rate of increment or the increment of the rate when there is a, these values is higher. This is the outbreak of the epidemic. And then is helping here with big increments. When we have 4, 4, 316, you see 3, 3, 4, 3, 2, 1, 3, 3, 3, 3, is when we have these values when something is going on. There is no a direct relationship. This is a complex issue. There is no a simple answer to explain it. Okay, but maybe it's a factor to be included in, and also in this period, in the second, the two epidemics, the more important we had. So we have four, 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 three, eight, two, and the increments here, one week after in many cases, because of the delay we have between the moment of the infection and when you are diagnostified at the medical center. Yeah. So something important might happen here. But we found also the opposite in this case, right? There was a very important uh, contrast. But in this case, uh, the level of the, the were, there were few, there was few flu in this year, OK? Maybe this is going to take place when uh, there is a baseline then it's starting to work in this way. Well, this has been published in different papers, but we decided to do the same in the United States. In this case, using an uh, influenza data for four sanitary regions on the East Coast, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, and Atlanta. Okay? And for this period of 2001, 2007, for the different seasons. And this is the evolution of the uh, epidemics on each region. And this is the influenza spreading periods. Sorry, this is, no, this is wrong. This is the maximum, the maximum rates, the maximum rates the, uh, for the different regions. They took place in many cases at different, in different, in a different 
some in different year. Okay, and, and this is again, there is a mistake here, okay? But the spreading period was very different, okay? From the beginning of the disease to the peak was very different in each region. And this is something we, we wanted to, to consider because we want to apply the index exclusively for the spreading periods. And the data, climatic data we were using in this case, it was an air mass-based classification, very uh, frequently used in the United States, uh, created by Scott Sheridan, Larry Kastein, and we were using this, a different catalog, as an input for the index. And this matrix, in this case, this is a key issue, the matrix, was defined by these experts according to their experience, okay? This is something, okay, they were, told on, they were given these, these numbers, like saying, if you change from a dry polar situation to a dry moderate, or from a dry tropical to a moisture moderate, I'm speaking about air physical properties now. I'm not speaking about uh, atmospheric uh, winds direction, like in, in the other one. Just to show that the input can be different, but it's defined in stages. So we found these two situations, in Boston, New York, Philadelphia, these points, these dots, and these circles, that they were representing these, these patterns. A first pattern is a period of time with a progressive increase in the contrast is more impacting when there is a short period of relatively stability followed by a new increase in contrast values. So it's like contrast in contrast, right? And a second pattern that was repeatedly repeated, the very high value of contrast can promote the initial outbreak of the epidemic and can make the spreading phase stronger than normal the week after, right? So we were trying to quantify the accumulated contrast for each period and for each region uh, for the spreading seasons and the average of isolated virus also to see if there were some relationships and again there is no a direct relationship but there is something going on in this in this data so mm, the, these conclusions for this specific uh, case study was that the matrix values must be redefined according to the a lab text or statistical models because this is essential okay to make this index uh, more acceptable and the spatial unit to apply the index should correspond with the specific climatic domains. This is something we didn't do in the United States because we were considering that an air mass is very big, can be even uh, 1,000 kilometers or more, and the physical properties, but the physical properties will vary in this big region. So uh, in Spain, we were defining climatic units, but not here, as this is introducing a lot of noise in the analysis and the scale of impacts are relative for each region okay this is very important too so now there is a debate in the united states because some experts on uh, microbiology and influenza and they they are some of them are supporting the idea they are including physical variables in their models assuming that like uh, Peter Palese from Mount Sinai in New York, that uh, there is a dependence on, of influenza transmission on relative humidity and air temperature. This is a group in, working in New York. And also uh, Jeffrey Shaman, one of the persons who is a very relevant person in the States, is also working with absolute humidity, okay? Considering something that they didn't consider 10 years ago. In some cases, they didn't want to know about these issues, but now they are including these factors in the models. And there is a big debate that is in the newspaper about if it is related or not. Well, the key issue in this index is the matrix. How can we define the matrix? Otherwise, and now we are trying to um, give a new approach to this idea of the matrix with a new project based on notifiable diseases and a big database of hospital admissions in Spain. So trying to see if uh, 
these hospital admissions can be a good sample in relation to the registers of these not disabled diseases. Uh, and then we have to start using uh, some statistical models in order to define relative risks to be able to create a new uh, matrix in which uh, values be representative of something. So we were testing different models like generalized additive models, linear models in relation to the two sources of data to know if this can be a good, a good sample uh, to understand uh, how these uh, events are taking place and we are calculating the uh, relative risk for circula different circulation weather types. We have here north, you will not see it, north, east, northwest and then we have here the relative risk for the different regions in Spain. Okay, And this is uh, another way of representing this information just to confirm that some relative ri risks are significant in terms of they can be used and this is also the same but with lags of seven days for each type of uh, uh, atmospheric pattern. Right? These are three different regions so and with a lag of seven days so at the end is uh, we are trying to define this matrix based on this relative risk to, m to make more coherent the calculation of the index and also we are defining the relative risks for the sequences of the changes that is important in terms of if you move from a, a high pressure to a northeast situation if you move from northwest to northeast these are the relative risks okay so we we are expecting some good results from this new approach in which the matrix will have an statistical background right so in order to define this uh, new approach so some final conclusions in relation to the, the original idea of developing health warning systems based on biometrological forecasting can be that any new health warning system, any methodology should be simple. So anyone can participate in the validation process. This is quite easy to calculate for any of you. And they must be designed considering the normal operative systems of meteorological services because meteorological services are the main source for any bio meteorological forecasting. It must be applicable in different regions of the world and they must be easily implemented in different electronic environments. Right? So the main problem usually is that the validation will depend on access to medical information in many cases. So finally this is the cycle of this uh, early warning system or any early warning system based on these ideas of biometrology in which a conceptual model should be uh, promoted and technically implemented and it requires permanent validation at an international level if we want to improve the, 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 the early warning system and this should take us to the social services and to make decisions at the governmental uh, level like when a, an earthquake is taking place there will be someone at the government making decisions for policemen, uh, firemen to behave in a specific way. So this is the second part of any biometrological early warning system. Right? So uh, this is all I wanted to tell you. Thank you. Serious, and you looked okay. When this happens, sometimes we have this other thing before or something. Did you make some, I mean, statistical analysis to see that uh, these uh, are just uh, 
significant the fact that you see something before? Or we were doing some basic exploratory analysis in relation to, uh, for instance, temperature and air humidity that was measured from 8 in the morning till 11 in the evening, and some correlation that they were significant in relation to with the spreading of the disease. But looking at temperatures and these variables every 10 minutes. We were measuring this every 10 minutes at the beginning. And now that's why we are moving to the idea of the relative risk and generalized additive models as a, uh, something that is going to give this more statistical uh, approach to the computation of the index based on this matrix. But confirming that this relative risk, in many cases, uh, they, they, are, they are doing very well for different types of atmospheric circulation. For instance, we have realized that when we have a situation from the uh, northwest that is bringing uh, some rain and the air humidity is high, and suddenly we move to a synoptic situation in Spain from the east, there is an increase. Uh, a different, uh, an increase, a very important increase on the influenza rate. And this uh, pattern is happening many times. The frequency of this pattern is repeating. So it makes sense because the humidity will spread the disease and suddenly dry air will allow the virus to develop in the throat. And this forecast is really good the meteorological one, and we should use it. But one might say, if you look at the data that you showed on influenza, the seasonality is extremely strong. Mm -hmm. But it didn't seem to me that the seasonality of the biometeorological index was nearly as no. It it's not seasonally varied. No. The, the disease is extremely seasonal. So doesn't that suggest that, in fact, this contrast is not an explanatory factor? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you are looking for seasonality, no. No, you will not find it. But if you look at the specific points, I know, statistically, this is something you will probably not accept. But if you look at the specific moments in which the contrast is being high, and you count uh, just the percentage of times that this is taking place, and this is like, let's say, over 70%, 66%. Any early warning system, apart from the statistics, we consider that if, I, uh, if you are able to forecast that something is going to happen six, seven times, from 10, even if it's not statistically proof, would you use it? As no? No. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, um, I don't know, do you, in your analysis, do you reference these, the cases to the total population per unit area or the population density? It's, re re it's related to the population. There is a, the rate is computed by the medical doctors according to the population that each medical doctor uh, has assigned or each center. So which means if you have a, a district, for example, or if you are working at uh, a unit, uh, you are generalizing that the, the uh, humidity is the same. There is a network, Sentin Sentinel network, that is collecting this information based on uh, 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 of the population that is related to this center unit. Mm -hmm. yeah, but what I'm saying is exposure will vary within that uh, uh, your, your, your minimum making unit. I don't know if it's a district or it's a, a small... It's an autonomous community. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's like a province. So you assume it's homogeneous? If it's a problem, usually you have relative risk. It might vary from point A to point B within the same uh, 
this I thought you were getting the data as a GPS coordinates that you could be able to relate the no, the, the minor scale than working at uh, no the points we are the, the data are collected like uh, for a specific uh, province that is a uh, different health centers mm -hmm. and doctors who are going to die to give the diagnostic to people they will collect this information they will submit it to a national center according to the uh, population that is being assigned to each center so there is a, uh, a sample for each for each province in this case This one? Does it add any other medical interpretation or real life interpretation aside that it is the risk is higher at this side and more at this side is lower? Well. This one. This is something uh, we have produced just recently, and the idea, I'm not an expert on this, this is done by a person who is working with me, but the idea is that uh, if this is not crossing this line of one, this is significant, and this is going to tell you the mm, percentage of uh, how the, the risk will increase in terms of percentage on this side or on this side. This, uh, these are the values we have on the right of one, on the left of one, okay? That's the general idea I have about these models because I'm not an expert on these models. There are, group, there are some people working in my group, they work with these models, they know about statistics much more than I know, and, but they told me that this is really good, what we are obtaining. Looking at the sequences of uh, weather patterns, because they are, let's say, significant when they are not crossing this, okay, and they can tell you the relative risk, uh, statistically, that is different to the idea of the risk we are using on geoscience. Exactly. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.